Hi, welcome to the Trauma and Resilience Podcast. I'm Ricky Robertson. Our guest today is William Kellebrew. William is an advocate for the safety, protection, and well being of children, youth, and families. William, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for having me, Ricky. William, you've had this extraordinary career where you've gotten to work in public policy and with different organizations and schools. And so I'm curious about some of the work that you've done with schools and community-based organizations. Would you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I, I think that schools uh, <clears throat> really needed to know what were the perspectives and the perceptions of students who um, who have or have not experienced violence in schools or uh, been exposed to violence in schools. And so a lot of times schools don't have that information. A lot of times school, schools don't know what students are actually going through. So uh, we were part of uh, helping them to understand what impact trauma has had on, on their lives. Um, additionally, um, really, so those perceptions were very important. Uh, additionally, um, really engaging in a trauma-informed healing-centered approaches, right? Where uh, kids would have, you know, healing circles, uh, be able to uh, be peer leaders themselves and be of support themselves. Uh, but schools were really able to um, collaboratively provide and create safer spaces for children to be able, be able to express themselves. Um, you know, what I what I heard so much of in, in schools from teachers and professionals and, 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 um, and practitioners in schools was that uh, they have a tough job between uh, monitoring the class and between providing educational support um, and lessons, uh, teachers were feeling like they were they they needed to have two or three jobs and really impact the social social emotional learning of kids, and that's very difficult. But it's important to remember that you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. So it's not about taking on the job of a social worker, but it's really knowing how to really recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, be able to um, respond appropriately, and then also be able to refer. So ensuring that uh, there is a, a, a roadmap to being able to um, access services, to being able to, to, to begin the healing process or being able to identify and address those issues in school. I think it's so impactful for kids to really have multiple layers of, of protection mm -hmm. um, and engagement. And I think that uh, uh, Kids spend most of their their time, uh, their wake waking time in in a classroom or in a school. Uh, but uh, research has actually shown that you know kids are most vulnerable when there's no supervision. Right, right after school, there's a, there's very little supervision, and with many of the programs ending in in jurisdictions around recreation, uh, music, um, kids are have limited uh, op less less options to be able to. Um, have supervision. And especially between 3 and 6 p.m., we find that kids are most victimized during that particular time period. So that's where community-based organizations take the baton. It's just the race, right? Taking the baton and being able to do that, but staying on the same page um, as schools. So the schools are really aware of what kind of activities kids are engaged in after school because, you know, teachers care about their students. I mean, oftentimes you see teachers go visit uh, you know, families' homes to find out how kids are doing. And that's an important piece where community-based organizations come in to take that baton and say, after out-of-time school uh, activities are important, but they also can complement, if you will, or they can uh, help strengthen what's happening in the school and vice versa. Um, think about it. I mean, many of the kids go home and they do their homework. They're going to need homework help, tutors. And oftentimes those community-based organizations are not only focusing on the educational aspect of that kid, but they're actually addressing the similar or same traumas that the schools are addressing. And if we're doing that in silos, in, in a segmented or fragmented way where one school is doing this and the community-based organization is doing that, then we lose the continuum for kids. So if we're going to hold kids' hands, if we're going to hold children's hands, then we should be modeling what holding hands look like. We had to hold hands with our community. We had to hold hands with our families. We had to hold hands with those who are touching our students and ask those questions when students come back to school. So what did you do yesterday after school? And, and really engage students from their perspective and it brings in their voice and choice. So it really takes a village and that's just not a cliche. 
It takes a village, it takes a city, it takes a community and a neighborhood to, to make sure that kids are safe, but also, again, always having fun. And I think that's important for folks to to recognize, too, that as educators, you know, we can't do it by ourselves. It's, so much gets put on educators in schools. And, and I think there's a lot of emphasis right now on, on schools providing mental health supports for students. And I don't, you know, I think that schools can really be a bridge for mental health supports, community-based supports, partnerships, like you said, with community-based organizations to provide care and enrichment opportunities and support to children and families. It really is something where schools can be part of a community of care, but they can't take all this on themselves. And so looking for Mm -hmm. those opportunities within your community to be a bridge between the school and community-based organizations or maybe other, you know, uh, agencies or, or different supports for children and families seems so, so important to support the well-being of really the entire community and, and the, the role right. a school can yeah. play in that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, not every child is in school. You know, we often work with opportunity youth uh, in, in, in many aspects. People um, have termed that transitional age youth, right? Those those young people who are maybe 17 or 18 years old and going on to 21. Um, I can remember when I was 18, 18 and 21, I needed some people to hold my hand at that particular time. So developmentally, uh, the, you know, this this age may not always you know, be cognizant of the dangers of you know, what's out in the community um, or even at school. Remember that um, I, I think, uh, you know, more than 90 percent of the kids who are victimized or experienced trauma um, experience that from from someone they know mm-hmm. and, and and many of them they know very well so it's not about those people we're talking about this is about all of us and so I think that there are many kids who are um you know you know out of school um you know young kids who who may not be in school what are those community supports that again take the baton or handed the baton so that the work um, and the support continues. Again, this is a continuum and separating it all out um, really separates the child and, and, and has the potential to isolate kids. Um, in my own story of, of, uh, of, of um, I would say my own childhood trauma and also my resilience, um, you know, my life reflected not only what uh, was done that was harmful, that I thought was harmful now that I am um, you know, a, a, in, in social work. Uh, but secondly, what could what could uh, um, educators and community based organizations and family members have done to be able to not only prevent, but mitigate the circumstances that I even experienced as a child? I like that to be able to recognize, respond, and then also refer for additional support. That's right. Yeah. And what were what are some of just briefly, you know, if you're talking to educators, what are some of the the ways that they can recognize and respond to some of those symptoms that might show up in their classrooms? I think number one, um, we we've got to be able to uh, work with teachers to be able to uh, go through training mm. um, um, and receive some technical assistance around what are signs of of trauma, whether it's you know a kid who who has experienced domestic violence or a kid who has experienced uh, you know sexual abuse as a child, what are those signs um, that we're looking for? And so trainings, uh, whether it's uh, the trauma informed care trainings or whether it's social emotional learning trainings, um, it's really important to uh, continue to get that knowledge to learn and educate ourselves about the signs. Because I think, well, number one, I think that um, those are, that's the first line of uh, of, of, a, of of action right there. It's really saying, what, what is going on? And my antennas are going up. Mm. And I think that um, those kinds of trainings are important. You know, with the trauma-informed approach, it also focuses on the four R's when we talk about um, uh, uh, realizing the prevalence of trauma. Mm-hmm. So when kids walk in our room, we have 30 students, we understand out of those 30 students, you know, um, or one out of six of those students experiencing, um, you have to have experienced sexual uh, abuse before they reach at the age of 18, 18 for boys. Um, you know, uh, one out of three women, um, you know, may have experienced domestic violence in, in her lifetime. And that could really start with children witnessing violence and witnessing their parents and households um, 
um, fight or argue. So I think that realizing the prevalence is so important, but recognizing and understanding the role that trauma plays in the lives of the, the kids that we serve and the students that we serve, and then responding by putting our, uh, our knowledge into action. And then also, most importantly, is resisting re-traumatization mm. because kids often come into our uh, you know, environments and they've already experienced things. But how can we address that at the very core and at the very beginning? Because the, le- the, the more we wait, the more we wait, the more damage and the more harm that could be caused over time. You've spoken about the four R's of trauma. Would you share a little bit about what those are? So um, recognize responding refers from a different model. Okay. But when we talk about um, a trauma-informed approach, which you can involve those, but it's really the four R's are realizing the prevalence of trauma. So understanding that there, that, wait, we, we, we have kids who've gone through something. Mm -hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. You know, parents and families who've experienced something. What is that? So realizing the prevalence, realize number two, recognize, right? Recognize the impact that it has caused on, uh, the, the prevalence, like the individuals who've actually experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. And then number three, we're going to respond by putting our knowledge into action. And then number four, we are going to resist re-traumatization in our systems, Hmm. in our care. And I think about, you know, responding in ways where we're building that relationship, we're creating structure and routine, we're providing that sense of belonging and safety in our classrooms. I think educators can also respond in ways where they help students to build those skills, to manage difficult emotions and just feel safe enough to be able to talk and share and receive additional support as needed in their buildings. And I think that we do a lot of work to respond. And I think it's so important that we do work to also realize how prevalent trauma is and to recognize the various impacts it can have on a young person's development and well-being and also their ability to learn, right? We know that the trauma mm-hmm. can can put a student into that persistent state of fight, flight, or freeze that can make it difficult for them to focus and mm-hmm. engage and, and make appropriate choices behaviorally, et cetera, because their brain and body can be kind of hijacked by some of those expo- those experiences of toxic stress. I am curious, though, about avoiding or resisting, rather, re-traumatization. Are there any examples you can think of of a school that you've worked with where they identified a practice uh, or, or perhaps something they needed to stop doing in order to prevent or resist re-traumatizing students? That's an, an interesting question. And I think you have a, a, a lot of key points in there around, um, you know, structure and routine and predictability for kids. So let me, let me categorize it in this way. Um, we often talk about three most common um, hot buttons. I'll say hot buttons for the kids, mm-hmm. but I'll say triggers, triggers, mm. things that it, that that it, uh, provoke us emotionally. Mm. Um, I, 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 there's three most common, and number one um, is the sense of loss of control. Mm. Number two is a power differential, and number three uh, is the lack of predictability. And I think that when we talk about um, you know, the sense of loss of control, there's often this fight and this this pull and this tension around, you know, kids behaving and, you know, teachers saying, you know, don't do that, or kids saying, you know, and trying to grab that control. Um, oftentimes kids are going to come into programs, come into school where they have been where 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 they've been victimized or traumatized, they've lost control of their entire environment. Mm. And so they're they're trying to gain that control. And so in classrooms, that might look like, you know, uh, leaning in the chair and, and, and just going back, right. And trying to, you know, how um, we've all done it before. I think we've, we've, we've leaned in our chair on the two, on the two back um, <laughs> legs mm-hmm. and we're leaning yet yeah, while it's very dangerous for the kid in many respects, if teachers can see that that kid is trying to actually cope, and uh, what Dr. Bruce Perry, Perry often uh, called uh, uh, rhythmic repetitive movement, kids are really trying to trying to to, to regulate 
or self-regulate to be able to get to a place of, in a sense of control. Mm. But what happens in classrooms often when that happens? So teachers might say, stop leaning in there. They're absolutely correct in terms of the safety piece, but don't overlook the idea that there's a coping mechanism there, right? So instead of having chairs, a one school, uh, took away all of the chairs with stands and they actually put rocking chairs in the classroom or chairs that swiveled, right? So kids weren't limited to to movement. So when teachers understand that movement is often helping kids to self-regulate, that is one way. Um, And then we talk about a power differential, right? Where there are some natural differentials, you know, student, teachers, parent, and child, police officer and somebody being pulled over, but what happens after that relationship comes together and there's action, you know? So it's important to understand um, a trauma-informed approach around mutuality and how can we, uh, you know, if you have to say, I'm the teacher, I have control, I'm the boss, you know, um, you know, there are other ways to, to, to be able to showcase how uh, your your authority, uh, um, um, you know, can can make space for for kids to be able to to make decisions about their own actions. And then number three, the lack of predictability. I think when we're born, you know, everything that's predictable helps us to be able to regulate. So when we think about kids who who can't predict the next thing that's going to happen, it can be uh, uh, either. Um, um, you know, they can build anxiety around the lack of predictability. So when teachers have those structures in classrooms um, or places where kids could say, this is my calm area, this is my quiet area, and be able to make choices about going to that area is very important. And that brings on voice and choice, which is another trauma-informed principle. So I think understanding um, what can be emotionally charging or uh, provocative for kids um, or not, is important because of the uh, the lack, the sense of loss of control is tr- could be a trigger, a power differential could be a trigger, and also the lack of predictability can be a trigger. So we want to add predictability in as much as possible. We want to add opportunities for kids to have self control and be able to self regulate in from their perspective as long as it's healthy and safe. And then of course we want to eliminate the 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 sense of of I'm your boss, or even when we work, right? So I'm your boss, right? We change that language to supervisor. It's a role rather than, you know, some kind of action that's going to control people that way. So it's important that we understand that very early on. I think that's so powerful. And it makes me think about, you know, it it really is for an educator, you know, it's it's about us kind of finding that middle ground sometimes, right? It's not about being, right. it's not about being overly strict. <laughs> and it's also not about being permissive. It's finding that kind of middle ground of how can I be connected and firm, right? How do I build those relationships, have that empathy, but also provide that structure, that positive accountability. And I think of the work of Jane Nelson and positive discipline, you know, kind of how do I connect before I correct behavior? Mm-hmm. And I think when you talked about, That's right. you know, the, the, the power differentials and, and you talked about kind of the loss of control, that sometimes it really is about noticing the student first before we we redirect the behavior. You know, it's great to see you, and and you know, please take out those earbuds. It'll you know, it'll help you learn better. Right? <laughs> giving giving the student an opportunity to feel seen before we we rush in. Absolutely, you know, these are my rules, and this is how it's done here. And and providing those appropriate choices, as you said, which is also so critical. So, I really appreciate you though, kind of outlining those hot buttons or those triggers so that we can understand how to avoid re-traumatization and how to respond in ways that are really helpful to our students. And and ultimately, I think, make our jobs easier because then we can avoid as educators some of those power struggles or some of those things that can be really difficult for us too. And as a young person, in your experience of trauma, were there was there someone, whether it was an educator or social worker or someone who who was that that source of support or protection that did step in and kind of do do the right thing or do what was needed in that journey to support you? You know, Ricky, there were that that's kind of since chill bumps through me because mm-hmm. I think about them, you know, I'm very grateful for uh, those who actually stepped in, you know, my grandmother, she, she didn't have the the background to, to focus on how do you deal with, how do you, how do you, how do you address trauma in the family? Um, you know, she was traumatized herself. We, we had experienced the, 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 the death of my um, mother and brother when I was age 10. And that was very difficult to go through. And 
she her her strategy was let's just you know get together and keep it a secret she didn't say those words but she said she didn't want to talk about it she didn't she felt very embarrassed and you know about you know talking about that and very hurt it was her only daughter uh, she had sons but that was her only daughter and so we we used the strategy just forget about it and i took that strategy to school to fifth grade i took that strategy to fifth grade mm. and i and i remember my teacher um you know uh great 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 teacher but at that time i was doing what experts uh you know, often uh, uh say that children under the age of 10 do to be able to cope with trauma, part of their defense mechanism is dissociation. Mm -hmm. I used to stare off in class all, 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 all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But I got in trouble. And so one of the things that I focus on is that if we're gonna consequence young people, we're gonna consequence students, uh, we should understand what they're going through first because we could be consequencing not just an action, but we could be consequencing surviving. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing often is consequencing. We should ask ourselves this question. And this is a tool, Ricky, that I talk about. Mm. And that mm. is, if we're going to discipline, if we're going to issue a consequence, we should be asking ourselves one defining and delineating question. And that is, what are we consequencing? Because I wasn't staring out of the window in fifth grade to, 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 uh, to cause harm mm -hmm. you know but you know being punished in class to to have to write on a chalkboard um you know in front of all my classmates um you know i will pay attention in class you know that brought back and even compounded the feelings of shame mm -hmm. humiliation i walked into that room with humiliation at the beginning of the school year and um and unfortunately um you know teaching is just not enough in classrooms. It's about recognizing those signs. Remember recognizing them, responding appropriately with support, comfort versus control, we say, right? This is the time for comfort because when we see kids staring out of the windows or acting out in certain ways, how do we comfort that child? Because that child could need comfort in that moment because kids aren't learning or they could be in crises. Kids aren't learning in crises, mm -hmm. all right? We comfort first and we teach later. That's what the science tells us. That's what we know. If we can get the child to come back online mm -hmm. to where they're calm and they're able to think. And hey, the teacher's able to think because we teachers get upset too, or you know, parents get upset too, right? So we're all able to calm down. We understand that we comfort first, we teach later because kids are, we are not learning in crises. That's a very important point. And so for me, I was in ongoing chronic crises. Mm. So it was important for teachers to recognize that I probably needed more comfort than anything versus the control that was being placed on me in terms of punishment and consequences. I was surviving the fifth grade and the sixth grade and the seventh grade. And so there were teachers who came through for me. And I'll just say shortly uh, that um, my seventh grade assistant principal, Mr. Charles C. Christian, um, you know, um, I love this this man. He's deceased today. He died at 94, 96 years old. Mm. Uh, but, but when he was in his prime teaching uh, uh, capacity at my junior high school, he recognized one morning that I, I was distraught, that I had lost everything. And he could see it in my eyes. And that's when he made that call to my grandmother. And it was the first time that I actually received um, assistance professionally outside of um, you know, Mr. Christian reaching out to me and saying, you know, kid, you look distraught. And he got to my grandmother and that was my first um, hospitalization actually at 13 years old. But that was three years, Ricky, from my mother's killings mm. and brother's killing mm. to, to, to getting help. And I, I had to, I had to stand on a bridge and, and attempt to jump off of a bridge um, because I, I, I lost my dignity inside. That's how powerful that was. Luckily, I didn't jump yeah. and I and I knew to get to school. And it was only that teacher who recognized the signs, responded to me appropriately, and then referred over to my grandmother who reached out to Children's Hospital, who then um, uh, got me into an assessment where I where I where I it was a start of uh, an amazing journey for me of healing. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. No, thank you.
I think what what has really hit me in hearing your story and, and hearing that you know this assistant principal stepped in is I think about being an educator feeling overwhelmed by just sometimes the number of students you're teaching or, or sometimes the behaviors happening in the classroom and how important it is for us to find those ways to connect and to comfort and to to build those those points of connection those relationships and how you know if folks are listening i really feel like and, and you highlighted an assistant principal, I feel like it has to be a whole school effort that every, yes. you know, everyone in, everyone who works in the building has to be focused on, because everyone from the custodian to the, the paraprofessionals, the office staff, the principal, the administration, the teachers, everyone in the building has the opportunity to be that person, to be that person for a student. And it really requires us to be intentional about making sure every student in our school is known by name and by need that every student in the school has at least one adult that they have that connection with which in some respects like you shared can be life-saving and transformative and every person in the school from the from the bus driver to the to the school principal and everyone else has the opportunity to be that person i also think it's so important that like you shared we build those bridges with families that 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 phone call got made home to your grandmother to say like you know to check in to find out what's time. going on yeah. to you know and and that we can then even be a bridge between families and additional support but that connection to the family is also so critical uh, from what you shared so just such a powerful story and the fact that you know there's a saying in 12 step recovery we go from hurting to healing to helping and You've mm -hmm. done this mm -hmm. extraordinary job of that, right? Like, you know, in terms of, of your own journey. And so I appreciate you talking about the hurt, but then also the beginning of a healing journey. And you certainly have done this kind of, you know, lion's share work to then move into the ways that you transform and advocate for the protection and safety of young people and families. And so I want to honor you and acknowledge you for that. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. I really, uh, I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, you hit a bit of a chord there. Um, you know, um, I, I, I love to sing. So I think chords and harmony. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, how, how in harmony are we? And, um, you know, when I, when I, when I, uh, when I was 13 years old, um, I had my first ever therapist mm -hmm. and, um, my first ever therapist, she was a, an intern social worker. Now uh, I'm in the hands uh, of crises in the hands of an intern social worker. So it really, she, she made, I thought back, first day on the job, you got this kid yeah. who witnessed, who witnessed the murders of their family members and, you know, is in crises yeah. and, and doesn't even have the dignity and and to be able to crawl to even get to a safe space. Yeah. And so that's that that's how I envisioned it. But um I I ended up meeting up with my first ever therapist. I I actually remembered her name and I searched for her 25 years later mm -hmm. and I found her. And I mm -hmm. had to ask her really key questions um you know about things, you know, without divulging from her divulging and being unethical, you know, but she 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 um she she had to tell me that you know, um, when I was her her, her uh, client or when I was her patient, if you will, um, she she had actually lost her her mom. Hmm. So she was mirroring mirroring yeah. the hope, and the and she was mirroring the hope after loss that I didn't have much of or at all, and 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 she did and she didn't tell me that when I was a child. She just did the action of listening to me. She was just there with me. And, you know, it, it's like uh, when we're in a dark space or when, you know, traumatic things have happened to us, many people are afraid to talk about those things. After the killings, nobody wanted to hear my side of the story because they felt like it was too gr grotesque. They felt like it was going to harm them in some kind of way. And so nobody, even my family members did, they just couldn't take hearing what had happened in, in, in our, in our home that I had witnessed. Uh, but here you have a, 
a person who is an intern social worker who can sit there and listen and learn and be able to provide a safer space so I could just be comfortable. And that did wonders for me. That was my introduction to the mental health space. Mm. And luckily, I had a great introduction to it because then I learned that it's everyone's responsibility. You had an intern social worker. So that means that you can have a cafeteria worker, a bus driver, um, a custodial worker, anybody and everybody should be trained. This isn't about just teachers or, you know, counselors or social workers. Every single person that the child touches yeah. has to be engaged in 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 the child's safety protection and um in, you know in in thriving in life. And so what you shared about this the, you know this intern social worker brand new in in the role and the position and she starts by listening. And that is something that each and every one of us can do, right? It's it's like, you know, you've said uh, you don't have to be a therapist for an experience to be or an interaction to be therapeutic, right? And so just by beginning with listening or the ways we welcome students to school or, or just notice them during the day and acknowledge them or ask how their day is going. All these little moments of connection can be so meaningful for a young person to feel seen. I mean, I think when you talked about, you know, you used the word not having the, the dignity to even seek for help or to, to ask for help or whatever that, that might have been. And I think that I don't know, something about that struck me because I think that for a kid, right, for a kid, it's like you're like you said, you're you're just surviving. And Mm -hmm. I think so much of dignity is about for as a kid, I think so much of dignity is about understanding your worth based on how other people treat you and acknowledge you and see you. And you can't, you, 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 you have to, to make sure that every student is seen really means getting to know them. I think that there's something also in, in my own journey, there's something also about sometimes the shame that can, that can be instilled growing up, right? Like I think about, you know, um, I even think about just even, I grew up as, you know, a gay kid in central Florida bullied a lot in school Mm -hmm. you know had a fifth grade teacher who was like you know right before he sent the class out to recess he was like you know beat ricky up it'll make him less of a sissy right like and just kind of stop right like stop trusting teachers kind of instilled this real i read a book called uh healing the shame that binds by by john bradshaw Mm -hmm. and that just awakened me to see all the ways that that I'd had experiences in my life that had somehow diminished my sense of self-worth and had me look for that validation outside of myself, whether it was through people pleasing or achieving or trying to, co- or just feeling uh, unworthy or, or uh, less than in some way. And so I think that, that in hearing you talk, it's like this invitation where our own healing journey can begin with that self-acceptance and that when we when we disrupt the comparing and we start to relate to ourselves with more respect for our own dignity and maybe that's self-care you know i don't know maybe that's the first act of self-care in my in, is what you know what came to mind but we also have to engage in systems educational systems um, work systems um other systems that continue to tell us that we don't exist and that we aren't seen and that there should be shame around who you are, what you believe in, what you do, and it's compounding. Mm. And so I think that, uh, yes, we can think about these things ourselves, but there's a lot of responsibility for the systems on the systems to, to, to be able to shift and change, but also our own supports beyond ourselves. You know, what support systems do we have is so important. William, I think what you said about systems is so spot on and and systems are made up of people and oftentimes really well-intentioned people. You know, I don't think any educator, you know, comes into this profession because they want to work in a system that could potentially exacerbate harm. You know, we, we come in because we want to make a difference and we want to do what's right. And a lot of us work in systems that are pretty fraught and there needs to be a lot of work done to transform them. And so I think that, you know, to something that folks can take away is to really like start within your own sphere of influence, right? If you work within a system, whether it's mental health or criminal justice or education, 
you know, starting within your sphere of influence to start to model and advocate for the changes you want to see so that those systems really honor the dignity of both the people who work in them as well as the people that they serve or engage, you know? And so, like you said, that the work is also about systems and, and each of us, when we work in those systems, can start within our own sphere of influence to try to, to advocate and transform them and, and to find your people because it's, it's going to take a collective effort. For educators who'd like to learn more about trauma-informed practices, you know, is there a book or a podcast or a movie or a resource that you have found beneficial for your own learning journey that you'd like to, to recommend? I have a sort of uh, different categories for it. Uh, and one of them is sort of the, the, the research and scholarly articles that I read, which are, you know, when I think that um, for those who have access to those or can gain access or, um, you know, can ask for access, um, what are those tools that we could be able to implement um, a, a healing centered approach um, in our environment? Right. And so I, I, I love those things. I think keeping to those scholarly articles for researchers and academics and others who, uh, you know, are, are looking at this information, that's always good. Um, I also think that um, tip 57, SAMHSA's tip 57 gives us a foundation. Um, there's a, you can go into SAMHSA's uh, store, if you will, and anybody can download this, but you'll learn more about um, what is trauma awareness, what is uh, trauma sensitive, and what is also trauma specific. So, you know, it, it tells about what is trauma informed care. We've grown so much since that book, this big catalog, which is called Tip 57. Um, and I keep it always uh, trauma informed care and behavioral health services. I always keep it near me, mm -hmm. right? Because I always want to know, because it has a lot of literature in it, it has a lot of learning. The other thing I would say, there's a really good book that I, um, I got. I'm called uh, Fostering Resilient Learners. And because I was working, doing work in schools, this is really a school-based tool mm -hmm. for um, schools to think about what trauma-informed approaches they could use. And then one other one I, I love is um, Richard Malika's Healing Invisible Wounds. And he makes a statement, I think I'm gonna paraphrase this, but violence causes trauma and trauma causes violence. Mm -hmm. And what he's talking about is that it's a cycle. And what I've learned in social work is that when there is a cycle present of abuse and violence and, you know, um, you know, neglect, even things that we don't even know that happen to us. Right. Um, but when those things are happening to us, what Richard Malik is talking about is, um, you know, that cycle, I've learned that you make one change. If you can make one singular positive change, you can impact the entire cycle. And that's important to believe because sometimes you can only make one incremental change. You can't change every single thing. And especially you can't change everything about everybody else. The one change I made, I'm going to give you a distinct thing. One change I made growing up, um, I used to not like my grandmother yelling and yelling and yelling. Well, she was very traumatized, you know, over everything, right? And the yelling in the household used to get so hard. But my therapist um, as a teenager said to me, have you ever tried laughing? Humor. And I didn't think that was going to work. But I, then I started laughing kind of behind my grandmother's back. Um, and and I started to feel <laughs> not, not in front of her at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember the time she said, what are you laughing at? I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, but that humor took the weight off of me of it being such a serious topic, right? She, yes, she was yelling. And yeah, there were those words kind of hurt, but I stopped internalizing things. Um, and then I started to influence her laughing at certain things. And so um, intergenerationally, my nep nieces and nephews weren't born yet. But guess what? When they came out uh, into the world, what do you think they started doing? They didn't get upset. In fact, they'll say to me, grandma's yelling. That's so funny. And they'll start laughing and she she doesn't take it as seriously as well. So we broke that cycle of hmm. constant, you know, um, um, verbal um, excitement, hyper excitement, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Respect my grandma. Yeah, yeah. This one. <laughs> yeah. what the, what the <laughs> but she did a great job with us. But now, and now she's Mr. Miss, Miss, Miss trauma informed herself, you know, mm. just in her actions. Mm. She just, just a, a wonderful lady. Beautiful. So one last question, um, William, what is one of the ways that this work has changed you? Oh, wow. 
You know, Ricky, I've become super aware. Um, I've become super aware of of uh, what can happen when trauma is experienced um, from myself and others. Um, I respond differently. I learn differently. Um, and I cope much differently than I did as a child and, and growing up. I think the biggest thing that it's done for me is it has enhanced my relationships. Because when, when child maltreatment is uh, 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 present, uh, when children um, experience trauma, they can often take those, uh, uh, the way that they experience that into uh, adult relationships mm -hmm. where, um, where it can be impactful in the way that they, they engage. And so I was that hyperactive and hyper alert teen and traumatized teen. And I didn't really have, I had good relationships, but a lot of it was just, um, you know, I, I didn't know that I was being harmful in the way that I was acting toward people or cutting people off or things. So I've just got my dignity back. Mm. I got my dignity back. Mm. Extraordinary that. Yeah. I have goosebumps. Thank you so much, William, for this conversation. It has been a privilege and an honor to be able to talk with you and share with you and learn from you. Thank you so much. And we'll go ahead and put links to the SAMHSA references as well as to William Kellebrew's website and ways for those in the audience to learn more about your work and also connect to some of those additional resources. Thank you so much. The Trauma and Resilience series is made possible by a partnership between the National Education Association and WETA. For more information, please visit adlit.org slash trauma. Trauma and Resilience is available on YouTube and on every major podcast platform. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the whole series so you won't miss an episode. Thank you.